Good morning. The scripture, today's scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 20. Verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. And be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading of His Word. Good morning. Um, Socrates, the ancient philosopher, wanted to find out who was the wisest man in Athens. So he went looking for the answer. The goddess of wisdom, Athena, told him, you are Socrates, you are the wisest person in Athens. That's impossible, replied Socrates, because I am aware that I know nothing. Athena said, that is why you are the wisest person in Athens. Who is the wisest person here? You are. You are the wisest person here. Not because of that you do not know, you know nothing, that you know that you know nothing, but because the Bible says so. Look at verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Notice carefully here that Paul is not asking us to walk in wisdom, but rather to walk as a wise child of God. He is not asking you to search for wisdom. He is not teaching you how to be wise. He's reminding you that you are already wise. What you, do, what you need to do now is to walk as a wise child of God. To walk as wise or otherwise. This is what we want to talk about today. The last of our trilogy of walks. The wisdom walk. Just like there is a huge difference between walking in the light and walking as light. There is a huge difference between walking in wisdom and walking as wise children. Walking, is, walking in wisdom is a search for wisdom. You may know how to um, uh, split an atom. Uh, you, you may know how to make a machine talk. Uh, you may know how to decode genome and scan electrical electricity in your brain, but you still live a foolish life. Walking as wise people is different. It is a way of life. You may not know how to split an atom. You may not know how to make machines talk, but you show wisdom in what is said and done. You show wisdom in how it is said and done. You show wisdom in why it is said and done. The Greco-Roman age was the age of wisdom. Greek philosophy was the way to wisdom. It teaches, for example, virtue and reasons will make people wise. Wisdom walk, however, is not to find out how to be wise. Wisdom walk is to live out your life as a wise child of God. We are already wise. We are already free, not because we learn it, we earn it through learning. No. God has already chosen us as His treasured possession. God has already forgiven our sins by the crucif 
fight Christ. God has already sealed us with His Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God in whom all treasures and all wisdoms and all knowledge are hidden in Him. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What God did for Christ, He did so for us. Christ is the power and wisdom of God, so are we who are in Christ. In the eyes of God, we are His beloved children. We are children of light. We are also children of wisdom. We show wisdom in our thoughts. We show wisdom in our speeches. We show wisdom in our deeds. We live what we believe. We know who we are. We speak the truth. We love generously. We admit our failures and our weaknesses. We are proud of who we are. And we are who we are. Several years ago, um, it, the soap company Dove did a research to find out how people saw themselves and how others saw them. The company hired uh, an FBI-trained forensic artist to sketch two pictures of each woman, one based on how the women described, described themselves and a second one based on complete strangers, based on how complete strangers describe them. And the finding was very interesting. The, the sketches done based on the strangers' description of the women were always more beautiful than the women who describe themselves. Interesting, right? It is said that most women do not appreciate their own beauty and they cannot accurately describe how they look. Am I right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Perspective is everything. It is not what you see, but the way you see it. When we change the way we look at ourselves, what we look at changes. My point is this. Regardless, regardless of what others say about you, in the eyes of God, you are always special. You are always beautiful. You are always wise. You are the masterpiece of His infinite wisdom recreated in Christ. His fingerprints are all over you. His signature is all over you. It is only when you truly come to embrace who you are in Christ, to see God's presence and experience it personally, that you will truly understand you are in a wisdom walk. Wisdom walk is to integrate to fuse together all kinds of factors from various sources of knowledge and experiences and to enter into the mind of God and to understand His will. Look at verses 16 and 17. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Here we see two terms, days and time. The days themselves are neutral depending on how you handle them. But Paul wanted us to pay attention here. Uh, Paul wanted us to recognize that the days are evil because they are under, they are under the control of the devil. How we handle the time we have how we handle the time we have determines the meaning of the days. 
That is why here Paul said, to make best use of the time. Some English translations, some English versions translate uh, to make the best use of time as to redeem the time, which means to get it back, to get it back from the devil. Do not let it be under the control of the devil. You see, we either make the best use of time or make bad use of time. By the way, the time that we mention here is not about the period of time, but the moment in life. The moment in life. Let's look at it this way. Imagine that one day you walk into a coffee shop and it's noisy, it is hot, humid, and crowded, and there is a smell of oil, uh, smoke, and different kind of sweat odor. But although you are very uncomfortable, somehow, somewhere, from the corner, the aroma of coffee wafts in your direction. Now, in that moment, what would you do? Let me tell you what I would do. I would go and grab the coffee. Now, that is seizing the opportunity. You see, the days we live in are like the coffee shop, which we have no control of. But the coffee is the time that we have right now. Make the full use, the best use of the time that you have right now. We live in the days that are under the control of the devil. But the moment in life is under our control. The time you lost can never be reclaimed. The time you kill can never be resurrected. The time you waste cannot be made up. Time is non-renewable. Time is non-transferable. Time is non Recyclable. Making the best use of time is to treasure what you have now to live the life you have at the moment and to understand the will of God. And that is the idea in verse 17. Verse 17 is really the main idea. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand, understand what the will of the Lord is. This verse here, understand what the Lord will is, is one of the verses that leads us to ask a lot of questions in life. For example, is this woman God's will for me? Is this school um, uh, God's will for me? Is this job God's will for me? But do you know that when the Bible speaks of the will of God, oftentimes it is about His overall plan of salvation for the creation. Not that trivial kind of questions. And in the context of Ephesians, this will of God is about His salvation plan, His eternal plan uh, outlined from chapters 1 through 3. What Paul wanted us to know is that about God's will in his salvation story and how our life can fit into it. But the problem is we take the sovereign will of God and personalize it as our own. Let me repeat. We take, we adopt the will of God, the term, and personalize it as our own. What, what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example, an illustration. When you look at a grand and beautiful scenery, what would you do? Naturally, we would want to snap a picture and with us in it, right? And after a while, we come back to the picture. We look at the picture. 
And what do we see there? Our focus is no longer the scenery, but us. We no longer look at the scenery, we look at we, us, we ourselves who are in the picture. We forget all about the scenery. We pirate the scenery and personalize it. Instead of us being part of the scenery, the scenery becomes us. Likewise, instead of us being part of God's grand big picture of salvation, we personalize it. Instead of asking how I can fit my life into God's will, we ask what the will of the Lord is for me. Uh, there was a young man um, who uh, went to his girlfriend and told her, I have been praying for so long, and now I know it is the will of God that I should marry you. And he waited expectantly for her to reply. Oh, really? The lady replied, Yes, I have also been praying so hard, and now I know that it is the will of God that I should be married to your best friend. We trivialize the will of God when we ask these trivial questions about the will of God. Look, God has already given us Jesus Christ, His Word, a common sense, the community. He has given us all these to guide us, to help us understand, understand what His desire is for us. Don't confuse the will of God with His desire for your life. It takes wisdom to recognize that the days are evil. It takes a wisdom walk to know how best to respond to it. Making the best use of time is to see Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come. Making the best use of time is to see yourself in between the Alpha and Omega, in between the beginning and the end. Making the best use of time is to live in Him who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Wisdom walk is to understand that your life is God's plan A, not plan B, not plan C. That your life is the only one and always be plan A. You are here for a purpose, not for yourself, but for God. You live, you move, and you have your being in the over plan of God. And whatever you are going through right now, whatever you are going through right now, or yesterday, or tomorrow, you are always part of His plan. You are His plan A in His infinite wisdom and in His sovereign will. And wisdom walk is a journey to discover what that grand plan of God is for you and how you can fit your life into God's grand salvation story. It is to seek first the kingdom, His kingdom and His righteousness. And He will show you what His heart's desire is for you. Wisdom walk is last, but not the least. A walk filled with the Spirit. Verse 18 and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. I'm not sure about you, but when I look at this verse, I ask the question, why is there a sudden reference to drunkenness? Right, the, the, the few verses were talking about something else. But why here, 
a, a, a sudden reference to drunkenness. Was there a drinking problem in the church back then? Or was drink, being drunk a phenomenon when filled with the Holy Spirit? Why the, the mentioning of drunkenness here? Why did Paul compare being filled with the Spirit with being drunk, filled with wine, alcohol, spirits? Why such a comparison? Why? Have you ever wondered about that? The church Ephesus would understand what Paul was talking about when he uh, made that statement. Ephesus was a center of pagan worship, and one of the festivals was the Roman festival of Bacchus, the wine of God. Um, the God of wine, not the wine of God, the God of wine, Bacchus. Um, people, the worshippers, would come to the temple and they would get drunk. So by being drunk, they believe that they would be able to enter into the mind of their God and understand what the will of their God was for them. But for Paul, it is a different story. To understand the will of the Lord involve experience and also involve discover to discern what pleases the Lord. It is an ongoing process for the entire church, not individual. For the entire church, it is a continual continual feeling of the Spirit, not drunkenness. You just cannot replace, substitute spirits for God's Spirit. Spirits in part drunkenness that turns people into debauchery. But God's Spirit imparts life-giving power that transforms the church into a living body of Christ. In the New Testament, when one is under the control or, or guidance of the Holy Spirit, one produces the fruit or the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? But the result in verses 19 and 20 is very interesting. It's very different. Look at verses 19 and 20. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. At first glance, the verses can be confusing. How can we address one another with songs? How, how can I sing song to you and you sing song to me? How, how can we do that? Yeah, we know we make music to the Lord, we, we give thanks to God, but how, how can we sing song to, songs to one another? just doesn't make sense to me. How can we sing hymns, psalms, spiritual songs to one another? But look carefully at the verse. There is no mentioning of singing these songs to one another. The verse says to address one another, to speak with one another, to talk with one another to talk, to speak, to encourage one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Not to sing to one another with these songs. And also, the three categories of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, they are the same, referring to the same thing. They are referring to the songs, the Christian songs that the early church sang. Back then, today also, Christian songs are easy to remember, rich in biblical teaching, familiar to the church back then. But more importantly, these spiritual songs or, or Christian songs 
express their experiences, express their walks with the Lord. The early church spoke to one another from their hearts, encouraging one another with the songs they shared in praising God. So when someone heard the words, the lyrics, the tunes of that song would come into their mind. They would remember the song when they see the wording, uh, when they saw the wording. For example, uh, remember um, last Sunday we talked about uh, Light Walker. In verse 14, chapter 5, verse 14, Paul said, Paul was quoting one of their songs. And he said, Awake, O sleepers, and arise from the dead. That was one of the songs that they sang back then. And Paul was using that song to speak to them, not to sing to them. When they read this verse, this line, they would remember the tune, they would remember the lyrics, they would remember their experience. There's another example which I like. Um, in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27, verse, verses 25 to 27, chapter 16, Paul, after talking about the grand salvation plan of God, Paul broke out in song. In verses 25 to 27, let me read it to you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God, be glory forevermore. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that was the end of Romans, the epistles uh, to the Romans. Indeed, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forevermore. Amen. Uh, that was also one of the songs that Paul used to speak to the church. The early church was born in song. Early Christians were children of joy. In the midst of persecution and suffering and hardship, they never failed to sing. In every trial, there was a new victory. And in every victory, there was a new song to describe their victory. And in every song, there was a celebration of divine power. And they would use this experience, these songs that describe their experience to talk with one another, to encourage one another. No wonder, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached one sermon and 3,000 came, came to the Lord and be baptized. Today, the church is weak, not because it is born weak, but because we are not filled with the Spirit song. No wonder today we preach 3,000 sermons and not a single soul was saved. No wonder today the house of God is void of worshippers and the people of God are powerless. But church, we don't have to be weak. We don't have to stay weak. When we look at these two verses, we see a community full of mutual edification and encouragement. We see here that our God is building a people of power. Here we see a worshipping community full of praise from their hearts, which is from the centre of their intellect and their will, and not primarily through their emotion. Are we a people of power? Here we see a church that is taking up the priestly function. If you look at the verse, especially verse 20, they, they, they took up the priestly function. They gave thanks for everything, everything to God in the name of Jesus Christ. They were priests. 
are we the people of praise? Our God is building up a people of power, a people of praise. Here we see a people of faith coming together of one mind and in one accord, praising God and blessing others. Is that our church? Does that sound familiar to you? Isn't that our motto, our vision, our mission? This is the question for us today. At the end of the day, church, the trilogy of works will point us to one direction. Will we, for the glory of God, with one mind and in one accord, build a people of faith that blesses the community? That is the question for us. There was once, long time ago, an old lady who wanted to go to the top of Mount Zion, the holiest mountain in that land, to the temple of God to worship. But it was raining heavily and the wind was so strong that nobody could climb the mountain all the way up to the top. This old lady came to the foot of the mountain to check for the direction one last time. And a man saw her. The man told her, O oh woman, this mountain is soaked with rain, water. The wind is too strong. You cannot possibly climb this mountain right now. Oh, sir, the old woman replied, the climb to the temple will be no problem whatsoever. You see, my heart has been there all my life. Now, it is simply a matter of taking my body there as well. Oh, I like that. My heart has been there all my life. It is simply a matter of taking my body there as well. Do you see the answer to all problems? The answer is the heart. Your walk in life might be tough. From time to time, you will be tired and restless. The journey to the heart of God might be rough. From time to time, you will want to give up. But if your heart has been there all this while, it is a matter of time before you will take your body there as well. You will walk from strength to strength. You will walk with God and towards God. You will walk into the heart of God. You will feel His heartbeat and you will know His heart's desires. And it will be there that you will find peace. Your heart will be at rest and your soul jubilant. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us that we are your beloved children, that we are children of wisdom. We thank you that you have bestowed upon us the riches, the richness of your wisdom. We can walk as wise children the journey might be rough. The journey, the walk might be tough. But your grace is always sufficient. We might be tired and weak, but your strength is made complete in us. Fill our hearts with your Spirit so that we may understand what your will is for us. Take control of us so that we can live and move and for have our being in you and in you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.